before we kind of go to the next portion here, did I answer your question on inflammation and pain? Do we get, no, I didn't talk about pain, did I? Uh, I'm going to give you a few things about pain, and this is inflammatory pain. This would not be like neuralgia pain as much as um, inflammation like arthritis or a um, few other types of pain. Uh, inflammation causes so much pain in the body um, that I want everybody to know a few ways to do that. Where's Kent? Is Kent still here? <laughs> yeah, he must, have, he must be playing somewhere. That's fine. One of, the, one of my favorite is poke. We did talk a little bit about poke. Because it works on the lymph and the inflammation, that's a really good uh, arthritic uh, remedy. And when I say arthritis, I mean osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, although there's a hundred or so varieties, 60, something like that, varieties of arthritis, a rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune issue. So it's not going to be a, 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 a mechanical issue. That's going to where you're going to have to work on your immune system for that. Um, but if it's a mechanical arthritis from an injury, from inflammation, from overuse, from wear and tear, and your bones are grinding together, diet, as we talked about, liver, and then for the pain itself, the pain is a symptom. The pain is a symptom. It's not a disease. Pain is not a disease. What do we do? We treat the pain. We don't treat the inflammation or the cause of the inflammation. So if you're getting back to that cause, take care of that. But what you would do to help with the pain would be the poke root that we talked about. For y'all, unless you're experienced with poke, do the berries that I just gave you a, uh, the, the procedure to handle the berries where you start out with three and then you can freeze them or dry them and then take one extra a day till you get up to about 10 or 12. And the berries will be coming out in a month or two. So, uh, and they'll go all the way through till late. Can you, just buy them from the health <laughs> you can't buy poke. <laughs> no, it'll kill you. <laughs> they won't sell it. Very right, very dark purple. Yeah, this is going to be one you're going to have to go to a field and find because you won't be able to buy it. I have it as a tincture, and I do sell it if you, and it's, it's pretty helpful. I also sell the poke root, but it's drop dosage. Where you start with one drop and you increase to two drops and it's better to go twice a day with it. So one drop in the morning, the next time you'll take it will be one drop in the morning, one drop at night and, and you'll go to two drops in the morning, one drop at night and then two drops in the morning, two drops at night. You're increasing one drop a day and you'll wind up with about six to eight drops a day. So it's very potent. Yes, there is one growing if you look off the patio, there's medicine right out there. If you look off the patio here to the left, this way, that one single stalk that's about this tall, that's poke. It's got a big stem. And there is a, an old wives tell that if it's got a red stem, you, if the stem is turned red, you can't eat it. It's not true. What was our, what was our thing about eating it? Less smaller than your hand will be tasty. If it's bigger than that, it's going to be more bitter. Because any plant that bolts... And bolting means it makes a stem or it, it makes a flower, it goes to flower. Any stem, any plant that bolts like that will um, be more bitter. Yes, ma'am? <clears throat> Less than 10 inches or so. 12 inches, yeah, if it's 12, 10 inches, something like that, just as it's a shoot before it starts opening up. Another one for pain. I did talk about another one. Uh, You have to be very careful with the root. I do know people that, that achieve toxicity just by handling the root. So it's very potent. Uh, if you're going to dig up a root, and they'll be big, I mean, they're monster roots, um, handle it with gloves. Most people don't have a problem, but you don't know that till after that first exposure. And I do know somebody who was pretty sick for three days after, after exposing herself to the root like that, a, a raw, bare root. 
So even when I do it, I handle it with gloves. I chop it up away outside like this. I don't want to breathe it in. So yeah, it's pretty potent. So at this stage, no offense to anyone, but you didn't run a marathon the first day you learned to walk, right? So, so that one does need a little special care. So work with the berries first and get used to using the berries and used to what the plant will do for you. And then you can move on to the root. And the next time I come talk, if I come again, I'll, we'll talk about the root. But, but take your baby step on that plant. That's a definite intermediary plant, the root, the root part is, okay? Um, and then the devil's walking stick, that would be the, the bark on the devil's walking stick. When I cut it down, and it's a perennial, so it'll come down if you cut it all the way down to the ground. I'll get one about like this, chop off the little branches that come up at the top, and then I'll knock off the... Um, the thorns that are coming out between the joints. Remember we talked about how if you look at it, it's a jointed plant that looks like this and the spikes are in between. What does that look like? A bone or a, or the spine. So the pain coming out between, the spikes are coming out between the joints like that. And that's where most people have their back issues is um, between the joints with the discs. So that's where those spikes come off. And I'll just take my machete or whatever I chopped it down with and just go down through there and knock off the thorns. And then I can peel it pretty easy. And it's so thin you don't have to get the inside bark. You can take both barks. <clears throat> just be aware if you're going to make a tincture or you're going to make a tea that only about two-thirds of the amount of the material that you actually put in there is the medicinal part. So since you added the outer bark, you'll just have to do a little extra compared to what you would if it was just cambium layer. Does that make sense? Because if you're including the outer bark in there and it takes an ounce, well, if you've got a quarter of an ounce of out outer bark, then you've only got three quarters ounce of the good stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Um, that one, if you want to order something called Devil's Claw, that's very good. I get a lot of questions about wild lettuce. Uh, wild lettuce grows everywhere. Love it. Opium lettuce is what it's called a lot of times. But that's very much a misnomer that you see those advertisements talking about opium lettuce because the strength of lettuce is about an aspirin. So yes, it does help. And it especially helps with sleep through pain. So if you have pain and you just can't go to sleep um, because you're hurting so bad and you don't want to take a, a sleep pill or a pain pill, you can take the opium lettuce, which is just a prickly lettuce, uh, Lactua. There's several different varieties of Lactua, and I use them all. But you can take, a, you can take some of that uh, lettuce, and it's going to help you sleep through that pain Meaning it's not going to take away the pain. It's just going to help bring on sleep despite the fact that you're in pain. <clears throat> it doesn't really do anything for the pain itself. So how do you fix it? Do you fix it? <sighs> no, well, yes, you can. You can also powder it, sprinkle it in food, or make a tea from the, from the dried leaf. But the real process is <laughs> you chop it up and put it in a crock pot put some water in there. There's, it's pretty liquidy, so it doesn't take a lot of water. Uh, but you want to simmer it down, mash it up, just keep macerating it in there, simmer it down some more, mash it up, keep mashing it up. It takes about two days till you get a sludge. Then you take and put that sludge out and dry it until it's a tar. And then you'll put that tar in alcohol, 150 proof. So, or 190 proof is what I prefer, but North Carolina, you can, only, I think Virginia too, you can only get 150 proof. I go to South Carolina and get it where those rednecks will do 190 proof. Hank, Hank lives, somebody called him a redneck the other day because he lives in South Carolina. So I'm just making a joke. He knows we joke about that all the time. But, um, so, uh, and I'm like, why South Carolina would be a redneck? I don't know. <laughs> but um, when you go to South Carolina, you can get 190 proof. Uh, and I go to a little store in Landrum, which is down uh, about 20 miles from my house. So, why, why is such a high, um, It just requires that proof of alcohol. If you're using, all right, for example, if you have 80 proof alcohol, the proof is twice the number of the percent. So 80 proof alcohol has 
40%, 80 proof alcohol has 40% alcohol, which is 60% water. That's expensive tea. I mean, just quite frankly, you got 60% water, you have more water than you do alcohol. So there's a few things that you could get by, and there's a lot of people will use 80 proof, but it's nowhere near, you're not going to pull out nearly as much as if you use a higher proof on most everything. So the minimum I would use would be 100 proof, and that's 50% alcohol, 50% water. Uh, there are constituents that I use water in water that I'll pull out in water. So 100 proof is usually what you would use. Now the certain things like the, the lettuce is going to require almost all alcohol. It's not going to be done in water. Uh, so the 100 proof or the 80 proof is not going to do you any good to have that water in there. You'll want to use the, nine, the 190 proof, which is 95% alcohol. You can get a medicinal grade that's considered 100 proof, but that's just overkill. And it's a lot of trouble to get that. The 150 proof would be just fine for this particular instance. So you're don't, not going to have to have the 190 proof. One proof is rubbing alcohol. Rubbing alcohol is isopropyl. And that's, okay. yes, completely different alcohol. Uh, F, yes, I'm talking about ethanol, the drinking alcohol that you have to get at the liquor store. Vodka, yes, vodka. We have a joke about vodka, <laughs> vodka, or whatever. I'm sorry. I don't use glycerin simply because glycerin inhibits mineral absorption. So if you're using glycerin in your toothpaste, your your saliva is not. You're not. Your teeth are not absorbing any minerals from your saliva. Uh, if it's in your digestive tract, you're stopping mineral absorption. I don't use it for that reason, and it's an alcohol anyway. Glycerin is made from, as an alcohol. Um, it's made it from a sugar, sugar alcohol to glycerin. I don't know the process, but I just know it comes from alcohol. I can't tell you to give a minor alcohol. When you're talking about drop dosage, <laughs> understand what I'm saying? I can't tell you to give your minor child alcohol. <laughs> But if you're making a tincture and you're giving drops of alcohol, but I can't tell you to give your child alcohol, okay? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, that would be illegal. <laughs> yes? But how about for people that don't use alcohol at all? Um, if you're not going to use alcohol all, at all, there's, very f there, there's a few herbs that you just can't use as a tea, but most of them can be made as a tea. Um, one thing that I would think would be the, uh, the poke root, but you could certainly use the berry or the leaf. Um, another one. What about that lady that came in the booth a couple weeks ago and said she fixed it with water and then let it out for all time? Yeah, you can do that. If you're, if you're, but if you have an aversion for alcohol, meaning uh, an alco alcoholic who would not want any alcohol near them, or if it's just if it's a religious practice, or for whatever reason you just do not want to do alcohol, I certainly respect that very much, um, and I would su strongly suggest the teas. And I mean, we could talk, could certainly point you to some things that you would not do in water, but you're not going to do poker yet anyway. So, or I would like you not to do poker yet. So most everything could be done as a tea. And 100 years ago, they didn't use any alcohol. Nobody used alcohol for a medicinal remedy. It was all teas, it was poultices, compresses, infusions, uh, powders, you know, things were dehydrated and put into soup, bone broth, wine. You know, some, back in the day, if they did something with alcohol, it would probably be in a wine, like peach. Peach is very medicinal. Without the alcohol, it's not going to last quite as long, but if you're storing your herbs well, they'll certainly last until you can harvest them again. So um, if you had peach leaf, I just talked about peach leaf, great for upset stomach, nausea, uh, the tea would be just fine. It's great for women, for women's issues. Tea is great because those ovaries are hollow, the, the uterus is hollow, all of those issues that come along with that, the tea would be just fine. Um,
And if you're, st if you're storing it, getting all the alcohol, I mean, getting all the alcohol, getting all the water out of it uh, and storing it well, they'll last several years. So you'll, you'll retain that potency in a dried leaf. Yes, so what does the alcohol actually do? Alcohol will pull constituents out that water won't. Uh, that's not to say it's stronger or pulls out more. It's just there's a lot of constituents that do uh, extract better in an alcohol. And then it's convenient uh, for a lot of people. It's, you have the preservation. The tea will only last so long in the refrigerator uh, unless you put alcohol in it. Uh, when I make a mouthwash, I have 25% alcohol. Uh, it's mostly water, mostly a tea with a, with um, with uh, alcohol as the preservative. So um, it's only 25% alcohol. And how I do that, I'll extract my, let's do a little math here. Who was it that was mean to me earlier? I'm getting, I'm giving you a test. You get a math test. <laughs> let's do some ratios here. If you have 100 proof alcohol, it's 50% water, right? 50% <clears throat> alcohol. If you extract something that has very minimal amounts of water in it, let's say it's a bark, so that we're not we're going to take away that little small amount of water that's in the plant. Okay, so we're doing a dry herb, 100 proof alcohol. That's 50% alcohol right now. Once you extract that herb and you have it, uh, you have it um, in your jar, you can add up to 75% water and still preserve it. So let's, let's convert that. If you have one cup of alcohol, extracted alcohol with your herb, and your, your, your remainder is the menstruum, is what it's called, the remainder of your, the menstruum is, is one cup, you could add three cups to get that quart of mouthwash without having to put it in the refrigerator. So it's 25% alcohol. If it's 50% alcohol and you have a cup, you're going to take that down to 25%, you would have to add three cups. Mm -hmm. Make sense? No? Am I, have I confused you with the way I said it? Sometimes it's just the way. My geometry teacher was the absolute worst teacher in the world because she would get up there and, and say something just like it was in the book, and I would be like, I don't get it. And somebody would, my neighbor, my next, my classmate would say it in a different way and I'd be like, oh, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> but if you add one cup to that cup, you'd be cutting it half. Mm -hmm. So you're cutting 50 into 25, correct? Well, but you, you have, let's say you have, did I not say that right? Let me, maybe I'm confusing myself here. One cup of alcohol is 50%, so that's a half a cup. Yeah, you're right. It would only be one cup. You're right. I'm, I was doing that at 190 proof. Sorry, that was my mistake. If you are using 100 proof, which is half and half, it would only be one cup. If you're going to use 190 proof, which is what I normally use, then you would add three cups to get your 25%. Yes, thank you very much. Does that make sense? Yes. Everybody, did I unconfuse you? <laughs> I, I can confuse you once in a while. Okay, so um, what was... we? Were, um, that's how you, that's how you get, figure out how much water you would need to preserve. Now I'm going to tell you a ratio real quick for doing tinctures, and that would be using 100 proof. It's, there's only three or four brands of 100 proof in the, in the, the ABC store. <clears throat> one of them is Smirnoff has one. I don't use Smirnoff. It's just cheap liquor at expensive prices. I'll use that bottom shelf stuff and then if it's harsh you can add a little bit of honey and I'm talking a couple drops of honey to make it taste better or you could add uh, add some fruit in there cinnamon helps um, there's a lot of ways to make the medicine go down a little easier okay um, so if you are um, let's say you have you're gonna make a pint let's go with a pint because that would be enough for most everybody in here for your family at a time. You harvest your herb and you have a pint of alcohol. That's 16 ounces, right? To do 16 ounces, you can fill up a jar, like a mason jar, you know, a pint mason jar, stuff it full of herb and pour your alcohol in. That's a perfectly fine way to do 
remedies to do tinctures. That's called a folk method, like the old folks, folk method. That's what that's called. The problem with that is, it, for me, is I can't repeat that strength or that ratio. I don't know exactly how much I put in there. So to do, if I'm going to do a ratio method, the same way, put the herb in the jar, put alcohol in it, close it up, let it sit on the shelf, shake it every little bit, that's a tincture, right? If I'm going to do a ratio method so that I know how strong it is, this batch to the next batch to the next batch, what I'm going to do is take a one to two ratio on fresh material. And that's a generic ratio. Not everything is going to be that way. Blood root, things like that would be completely different. Poke is completely different. But if I'm going to just do the average herb, it's going to be um, one to two. That's one ounce weighed physical ounce of fresh herb to two ounces, fluid ounces, of menstruum. And that would be the 100 proof vodka. I very seldom use 80 proof, and I strongly encourage you not to use 80 proof either. Use 100 proof. So it's a dollar more, but it's worth it. Okay? So that'll be two ounces of fluid to one ounce of fresh herb. Problem with that is, if you just take this and stick it down in a jar, you're not going to have enough liquid in there. So what are you going to do? You're going to take and grind this up or chop it up very finely. So if you chop it on your, on your cutting board or if you have a root, you'll want to somehow chop it up with, with clippers or, or what have or whatever you can do to get it chopped up. And the finer it's ground, the more uh, surface you'll have, the more surface to extract the constituents that you're trying to get. So if you put whole leaf in there, that's going to be okay, but you would have a stronger, more potent tincture if you ground it up to a degree. And it doesn't, I'm not talking about to powder. You just grind it up a little bit so that you have more surface area. So Make sense? You have dried just, just hang on just a minute. Mm -hmm. So that's one ounce of fresh material to two ounces of liquid for fresh material. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay. What if it's dried? How much would you use? There's no liquid in this at that point. It's dried, almost powdery, crunchy, no pliability. It's going to break up, crunch up. What would you use? It would be one to five. Sometimes it'll be one to four. But on average, and you can do it one to four if you'd like and have it just a little more potent. But one to five is the average. And that means one ounce of that dried powdered or dried crushed herb and five ounces of liquid. Okay? Do the same thing. Shake it up. Let it sit on your shelf six weeks. There are some things that you can use in two weeks, but that's the exception. Usually everything is six weeks. I let some things go to a year just because I'll make four or five at a time and I'll take one down and the rest of them sit there for a year. Do you shake it every day? Mm-mm. How often do you shake it? When I think about it, I use uh, laboratory equipment, so my tinctures are usually done a lot quicker, and they're very potent. So I know from one batch to the next how much is in there. So get you a kitchen scale um, and weigh out that herb and put it in your jar and then put your, tincture, put your alcohol in it. If you're going to use a percolate, a, a soxalate, a magic butter machine, an extract, which is an extractor, or um, an ultrasonic method, you can do that differently. And those are laboratory equipment that you can invest in, but you do not have to. So I would certainly suggest you just getting used to making your, your six-week tinctures. Work with those. Find out how they're going to do for you. If you need the next batch to be a little more potent and do only four ounces of alcohol to one ounce of, of herb, that's fine. Now what happens if you have a real fluffy herb and even after you grind it down, you're barely getting your, your, your herb wet at that point? 
you can do it twice. And that will happen. You'll have something you grind it up like a mullen. If you grind up mullen, it just grows. It just keeps growing. <laughs> so I don't grind it. <laughs> I just leave it. I just chop up the leaves, you know, just chop them up with scissors, make it smaller so that I get more extraction area. But to grind it, I would have a problem. But let's say you ground it and you have a lot of fluffy herb and that four ounces, you've got one ounce and that four ounces of alcohol is not cutting it. You can do it twice. So uh, you can put your four ounces in there and then come back and put four ounces again. And that doesn't sound like the right ratio, but it works. Okay. Or you can cut it in half and do two ounces uh, of the herb in your four ounces of alcohol. Uh, let me say that again. You can do a half ounce in your four ounces of alcohol and then come back and do the other half in that same amount of alcohol. And you would just add a little bit of alcohol, about 25%. If you're doing one to four, let's say, if you're doing one to four, you can add about 25% just to moisten the herb, and you haven't changed your ratio. Is that confusing? You're just going to put some moisture back in there into the herb with a little bit of alcohol that doesn't count towards your ratio. Make sense? Anybody confused about that? No, I would let it sit for about an hour, just a couple of hours enough to absorb so that you have moist material at that point, but you're back at zero on the moisture. It's not way drier than it's supposed to be. You just bring it back up to zero and then you add your four ounces at that point. Does that make sense? Anybody, did I confuse anybody? Okay, and that's how you do a dry and it sits for uh, for your six weeks. If, you, if it's too much, um, you can do half of your, your uh, herb, put the other herb back on the shelf, and then when it's time to take that, that uh, mark, the, the dried amount out, you'll take out that old uh, herb and put in the rest of that herb in that same amount of alcohol, in that same alcohol. And you're, tinct you're actually tincturing it twice. Is that confusing? Because if you have too much fluffy herb, and I would only do that with the fluffy herb, where you can't get enough liquid in there if you're going to use a ratio. Does that make sense? So you got all this fluffy herb, cut that in half and tincture it with your alcohol, squeeze that out, and on that what's left, that, that menstruum that's left, the liquid that's left, put more herb, the rest of your herb back in it the rest of your ounce of herb back in it. <clears throat> but that's only with fluffy, very fluffy herbs that's not gonna absorb. Is that confusing? You still have the same amount at the end? Okay, all right, good. All right, y'all ready to do a little foraging? I sacrificed and slaved and Patty went out there with me, she can attest to it. We got soaked. Um, so I picked a few things around the yard that we've kind of talked about. Some of them we haven't talked about, but I want you to know there's a few edibles in here as well as um, medicinals. So the first one, we had a little controversy over this. <laughs> Does anybody recognize this plant? It's a sorrel. What do we say about sorrel? It has oxalic acid in it. But I think I picked enough that y'all can get a tiny little taste of this. Um, this is wood sorrel, not sheep sorrel. Sheep sorrel is the one that's in the Essiac tea. <clears throat> but this is wood sorrel. Wonderful in pesto. I would just take and clip all that and just use these stems. These stems, because it's already started to bolt, what does bolt mean? Make, it's going to flower and then to seed. You've got seed pods here and it's already making flowers. So this is not as good and the stems are a little bit stiffer. But this is very tender before it makes the flower. And you can see a lot of people think it's in the clover family, but it actually is not in the clover family. It's in the oxalis family. So y'all can pass that one around. Yeah, you can take a little leaf off of it. It's been washed by the rain. Yeah, I didn't see any dogs over on that side. Well, maybe one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, here's another one while that's going around. This is not a great uh, specimen. Does anybody recognize this? That's a purple flower, by the way. Red clover. Red clover. Why didn't they call it purple clover? I don't know. What does uh, scarlet clover look like? 
It's the one that's red, but this is red clover. <laughs> Very good for women. Uh, helps with menopausal issues, um, hot flashes, also with PMS. This is an, has a, a, an estrogen in it, a phytoestrogen. So gentlemen, um, it's not something that you would want to take every day or eat every day, but it's highly edible. This um, flower is delicious. It's sweet. Um, if you were to eat a bunch of them every day, we might have to talk. But first, I would suggest you stop stop drinking beer or using plastics because there's more phytoestrogen in those than there are in this plant. These grow real good because they've got dogs outside. Yeah. <laughs> These are uh, wonderful for women. I put this a lot of times with red raspberry leaf. Speaking of which, let me see here. This, uh, not that. Patty, did we put... Did we get that blackberry leaf? Okay. Uh, well, maybe I didn't. I thought I did. There's one in here somewhere. I just don't see it. Black, ra uh, black or red raspberry. Here's another one. This one's a little better if y'all can't. So that's different than the crim crimson. Crimson, yes. Crimson clover is still has phytogen, phytogen in it, phytoestrogens in it. Uh, but this has more, and this, this one is really good for women, uh, those women's issues. I'll use it as a calming, for a calming tea on the PMS days uh, with red raspberry, and that was what I was looking for, the leaf. I picked a black raspberry leaf. I wanted to show you the difference in the leaves on, black, on a raspberry and blackberry. Blackberry, their leaves of three, both blackberry and raspberry, should you let it be? <laughs> That's not always true. The leaves of three let it be, you know, for poison ivy. It's not always true because blackberry has three leaves too. It'll have one in the center like this, and then the other two come out to the side, but they all point to the end. So you have one here and one like this, and one on this side like that too. But a raspberry has the one in the center, and those leaves are almost almost at a 90 degree angle where a blackberry is going to be up a raspberry is going to be down further like that and also there'll be a white coating on the stem of a raspberry now that's called a hoary coating h-o-a-r-y hoary mountain mint has a white coating lamb's quarter has a hoary coating that's an old english word for white coating so uh, on a lamb's quarter, it looks like a mineral, which it is a mineral uh, deposit on the plant. But that white coating is a yeast, a, a very, um, very, just a benign yeast. Uh, it's actually good for you. Um, but it makes that white coating on the, on the cane. So. Have, a, have the hoary coating, yeah, H-O-A-R-Y. Uh, let's see, uh, Hoary Mountain Mint has a coating. It looks like somebody's just sprinkled powder on it, you know, or dusted it, dusted it with flour. So you're saying the clover and the raspberry are both for women's issues? Mm -hmm. Ra red raspberry is very good for women's issues. Doesn't mean men can't take it. Uh, just like pine pollen is very good for men's issues. Um, and it's a testosterone balancer. It's an androgen. That's a word to look up and, and study. It's an androgen will balance testosterone issues, but women need testosterone as well. So just because um, usually as women age, it's, it's a testosterone estrogen balance. Um, young women, or excuse me, young men, I would never give um, pine pollen to. But men, once they hit about 40, they need a little bit of a boost, uh, a little bit of, of uh, energy, and a little bit more oomph that, that testosterone gives. Pine pollen is really good for those. Daughter is another one. Does anybody know what daughter is? Daughter is that gold, looks like a gold thread that just you mat up and wad out on top of plants and things. It's actually a parasitic plant that'll kill the host plant, but it's, it's uh, highly astringent and it's very good for testosterone. So. Daughter, D-O-D-D-E-R. Like doddering old type, yeah. It's like an orangey, orangey, goldy thread. Looks like somebody just took and threw out threads everywhere. Spaghetti stuff, yeah. That's a parasite. You got it? I need some. No, no, I was in honey harvest pine pollen. 
How do you harvest pine pollen? <laughs> How do you harvest pine pollen? Slow. Do what? On the car, yeah. Bodybuilders in California all got there and licked their car. So uh, that's how they actually found out it was good for testosterone. Very good for testosterone. Um, if you will go in the spring, when about March is when we start down in South Carolina, it, we kind of follow the line because it takes a lot of catechins off of pine trees to get enough pine pollen. So when I say a lot, we probably cover this rug in catechins and get maybe a quart of pine pollen. So it takes a lot, but you only take a little. You only take like a quarter teaspoon. Um, but when you see the catechins, everybody know what a catechin is. That's not the, that's not the cone. The catechins is the gold, little gold, looks like a cone on the end of the, the branch on the pine trees. Um, that's the catechin, and that's the male part of the, the pine tree. The cone is the female part that has the seed. This has the sperm. Um, so the catechin is actually, uh, when it releases, and you can, you can tap it, and it'll just make a powder. You want to get it before that. <laughs> so you have to time it just right. You want them when the, when the catechins are firm and uh, full, of pine, uh, pull, full of the pollen, uh, but you, you want to get them at that point when they're almost still juicy. And if you taste them, it'll be very tannic in your mouth, very astringent uh, and citrusy. Uh, so that's when you get it. But if you kind of flick it and it, you've, it's releasing the pollen, you've passed prime. That doesn't mean you can't still get some of it. Makes sense? So Marchish and certain varieties of pine are much better than others. Some of the catechins will be huge, like I've got pictures of them laying in my hand like this, but if you find them on the little tiny Virginia pines, they'll be about this big. But you want them when they're swollen and full and hard and firm, um, that's when you want to get the pine pollen. Very few people are allergic to pine. That's not to say that, you're, that you won't be allergic to it, but the reason is, even though it's wind pollinated, that, that pollen particle is too large to, to get into where you would cause the, the, the aller allergic issues. So it's usually not the pollen that people are allergic to, unless you've tested that you're allergic to pine, po or pine but then you'd be allergic to everything on the pine. You'd be allergic to if you touched pine tar or turpentine or um, pine saw cleaner type cleaners, you would be allergic to all of the pine. And there are people that are, uh, but there's other things that are blooming at the same time. Alder, oak, um, elder, certain elders are blooming very early like that, that put out a much more allergenic pollen than the pine. But if you have been tested for that, then you are allergic to pine. All right, let's see. We'll just go ahead with this one. You remember we talked about, somebody said this earlier. Locust, which one? We talked about two. What kinds of locust did we talk about? Remember? Black locust and honey locust. Which one is this? Hmm? This is the black locust. See the little thorns? Black locust has little thorns on it. So when I pass this around, just be aware of that. It's got little thorns on the, on the branch part. This is the one that you can only eat the flower. Only eat the flower. On the honey locust, it's got the big wad of thorns that are about like that. You can only eat the pod. And it's actually a source of sweetener. Or if you let it uh, get completely ripe, and dark brown is the source of cacao because it is uh, related to the cacao and the coffee tree, the Kentucky coffee tree. In Virginia, do you have Kentucky coffee trees? They hardly grow down here. Um, they just haven't gotten down here yet. So, Let's see, who knows what this one is? Mm -hmm. Yellow poplar, tulip poplar, and how do you know? Because it looks like a shirt. You ever notice that it looks like, you know, shirt under? <laughs> That's one way, and it also has little yellow flowers on it. Have y'all noticed the flowers that are just about gone now? You can still find some. You know what family this tree is in? This is a magnolia. This is a deciduous magnolia. Very, the, the, um, 
the flowers on this one is a very good antibiotic. So if you get those flowers, which is just about past now, but if you were to get those flowers and tincture those, you would have a jar of antibiotic that would work really well for skin issues or um, lung issues, respiratory. But it's in the magnolia family. Other deciduous magnolias, what does deciduous mean? Loses its leaves. Deciduous magnolias are very good for pain. You'll want the fruit, which is the cone uh, after the flower's gone, or the bark, and that's a deciduous magnolia. That would be cowcumber, cucumber magnolia, Fraser magnolia, um, tulip poplar, but this one is the least potent, so I wouldn't bother with it for pain. You, oh, golly, yeah, let me show you. Uh, God, it's been so long since I did that. This is so cool. You kids would love this. Let me see. I about forgot how to do it. God, I hadn't thought about that in ages. <laughs> All right. Or to put on your doll if you can find a big enough. Oh, missed it. Yeah, y'all can look it up. It's on my website. How to make a... Well... That's your little basket. <laughs> okay, we picked this one. This is one of my favorites. What is this? Anybody know? It's a false, dan false dandelion. False dandelion. Hmm? Say that again. When you mow it, it doesn't, when you mow it. <laughs> doesn't cut very well. This is what I would use for green spaghetti. Now, when you go, when, very early in the spring, when you go to pick these, they'll break down here, but the older they get, because it's bolted and the stems get stiffer, it wants to break up here. But when you break it, you can use it for, um, when you break it, you can use it for henna. It'll just show up as little, we used to play with it when we were little. See the little spots forming? We used to, would just draw stuff on it. My mama would get so mad. <laughs> I don't know why. But these break, where they break, they're tender, and it's called cat's ear. Sorry, I cannot remember the Latin name. It does, that's a latex. See how it's getting on my, y'all can break some of this off. And we used to just break, keep breaking and making the, making little designs on us. So you see the little dots, not my age spots, but the, <laughs> so, uh, but this is a cat's ear because this looks like a cat's ear, oddly enough. Uh, but you can take and saute these in butter in a frying pan, cast iron skillet. You know, the earlier in the spring, they'll be longer. But the later in the season they go, they get shorter where the, where the breaking point is here. Uh, and these are very meristematic, which means tender, tasty bits, palatable. Meristematic is a word for you, too. So this is cat's ear, and you could, you could harvest these, and when they're long, they're like spaghetti. My, my son, who's 35 now, uh, used to love cat's ear spaghetti, and I would make it with a lemon uh, piccata, or, or like a lemon butter piccata sauce, and you know, a piccata sauce has capers in it, and what I would use for the capers is daisy buds. Daisy is entirely edible. So... Leaves are very delicious, yeah, and the little buds, before they open, you can just pop those buds off like this and um, make capers with them. Very easy to make. So, not a hollow stem, or if, it's, if, it is, if that's the one that is hollow, it's just very tiny. That's how you tell it from daisy, or from a dandelion. Dandelion only has one stem, and it's hollow, and it goes down to a rosette, and the leaves actually do this like a Christmas tree, don't de Leon, like teeth of the lion. So they, they actually go backwards. Uh, but these leaves are hairy and they do form a rosette. Um, but, um, and it's, it's actually really good. I'll go and harvest a whole bunch of them in a field and come home and have spaghetti. Mm -hmm. 
This is the, um, the blackberry. Now this blackberry has five. A lot of times you can't see these leaves down there, but if you'll notice, see how they're pointed toward the tip? That's, I won't pass this one around because there's thorns all over it. But, and this, this margin of the leaf is serrated. What's the margin? Edge of the leaf. So, that's your botany. I, the reason I repeat those things is that's your botany. A good book to learn botany is called Botany in a Day by Thomas Elpel. E-L-P-E-L. Is that a compound leaf or a simple leaf? Um, because these are individual leaves, they're simple. But this is a leaf cluster. So, Botany in a Day by Thomas Elpel. E L P E L. All right, what is that? This is prickly lettuce, and the reason can you see why it's prickly? Because <laughs> it's got prickles on it. This lettuce, and then uh, there's another one. Uh, this is a uh, Lactua. Um, I forgot. Uh, there's two. One doesn't have the prickles on it, but you can use them both in a salad. I don't use this one as much unless you're going to cut out that stem because of the prickles on the back. But you can use it in a salad. You can use it as a cooked green like wilted lettuce uh, with an oil on it. Or you can make your tincture or use it for pain as a powder and put it in a capsule. But it's much more potent if you cook it like I talked about, cook it down and then take that tar and break it up and put that in a powder in your capsule. Yeah. The longer you leave your material in, and I'm guilty of this just like anybody else, the longer you leave the material in, it can degrade and cause, cause degrading. So you may have a, a, an inulin at the bottom of the jar. Uh, a number of years ago, I broke my leg. And in the hospital, they had me on a little bit of morphine. And they sent a whole bag of it. Yeah, but I, I didn't want to do that. So we, Nancy, made up wild lettuce tea, and I went from that morphine to that tea. Mm -hmm. It helps, it helps a lot, um, but people are fooled by the opium effect, you know, the, all the advertisements that talk about opium lettuce. It's not opium, it's not opium quality. It really helps with pain through sleep, or sleep through pain. I've seen somebody, believe it or not, I saw this picture last week of a friend of mine. He has a 25 foot Lactua, and I can't remember which one it is, 25 feet. It is massive. And the amount that, and he goes through a lot of, of lettuce, wild lettuce. So the amount that he's going through is just amazing. And that, he said, I'm going to use the whole plant. You may know what that is. I'm sorry, I handed white it to you. Oak. Why is that a white oak? Because it's white. Because the leaves, the leaves Let me see it to see. Which one is this? This, what is this? It's an oak. <laughs> what about the point that we talked about? Remember the point? See the, see the point? Which one's pointed? Red, Red oak. There's a, there's a little ri a rhyme about it or a little riddle to help you tell, but it's very politically incorrect. And I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't figured out something to take the, ch take the place of it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so having said that, I'm Native American. Uh, people think I'm Irish, but I'm not. <laughs> Um, a red oak is pointed like an arrow. Okay, that's as far as I'm going to go. White oaks are rounded like a bullet. So what is that? This one is pointed, pointed, very pointed. So it's a red oak. I don't know what variety of red oak, but there's white oak and red oak. So red oak is like this. Right. Pointed like an arrow. Round like a bullet. Round 
is a white oak, rounded point. <clears throat> yeah. So if this was the very end of the point, that would be a white oak because it's rounded. So that's, that's all I'm going to say on that because I don't want to offend anybody. And if you can think of a riddle to come up with white, pointed and rounded, I would certainly love to hear it. So I don't want, I don't want to offend anybody. They're not palatable. They wouldn't hurt you. They're full of tannic, tann tannins. Um, if you've ever had acorns that have not been processed well, that they're very tannic. In wild lettuce? Yeah, that, that latex is not going to be harmful. Um, there are certain latexes that you can take warts off with, like fig or milkweed. But Those, sometimes with your leaves, if you've got a, a new growth or an old growth, it can deceive you. I mean, you've like this oak, you've got chicky pen, you've got... you got a hundred. Yeah, There's a hundred, but they'll either be white or red. Correct. Of all these varieties, it depends on the age of that leaf, on how accurate it's going to show. Because sometimes you can see a blackjack oak that's, that's got a crazy leaf on it. Mm -hmm. And you can sometimes... It takes and so there's always exceptions to, yeah. to, to never say never, right? Uh, there's never an exception you unless you want it to be. We could talk about oaks. There's a hundred oaks. We could right. talk about oaks for hours. So are you saying so, that it's either a red oak or a white oak. Or a white oak. All the varieties? Mm -hmm. Pin oak. Pin oak falls under what? Pin oak has a rounded leaf. And then you got like a turkey oak. Turkey oak, chestnut oak. Right. So so live oak, oak, southern oak. oak. So we'll go on, we'll pass on from oaks. I just wanted you to see that that's an oak and you'll know to look for oaks because we find oaks very valuable because they're astringent. Why do we want astringents? Tighten tissues. Okay. Huh? Say again. Tighten up. Yeah. You can put white oak on your on your face. The 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 oil, the water. Yep. All right. We all know what this is, right? If you were picking this, what would you pick off of this? Which flowers? The one that the bee has not pollinated, which would be white. If these have already been pollinated. Well, you can, but there's no pollen left in it. These are the freshest. These are the ones that have not been pollinated. Mm -hmm. Yep, if you're going to pull the little... And this is the first thing that most people forage and they don't realize it. We did it when we were little. My granddaddy took three little cousins out. <laughs> Excuse me. So sorry. I must be allergic today <laughs> to something. Uh, my granddaddy took three little cousins out, and we uh, walk in with, with Papa, you know, just so happy to be with Papa. I just loved my Papa. Um, and he pulls a branch of, of, of honey, a honeysuckle, and one of the little cousins was like, I can't get my little drop to work. And it might have been me, but, you know. But anyway, it was me. <laughs> uh, I couldn't get mine to pull the little drop of honey out, so Papa had to do it for me. Because um, I was little. I was the littlest cousin, and they just hated me because I always was whining. Or some, some little cousin was always whining. Might have been me. But anyway, this is honeysuckle, so you'll want to. I don't have to pass this one around, right, y'all? They won't have nearly as much. Won't have nearly as much if you get the pollinated one. So if you're picking your honeysuckle branches and you come back to the house to take your blossoms off, you'll want to get most of the white ones. You, you can leave a lot of the yellow ones, because especially the older looking ones. If they look really old, obviously they're old, and it would be better to get the, the newer ones. So, all right, so does everybody know what this is? This is a sensitive plant in the, in the sensitive because when you touch the leaf, 
they will close up. I'm trying to open this up. This is the mimosa that we talked about earlier. So if you look at these leaves, and this one was right out here, if you look at these leaves, now I can take one or two of these and put them in a glass of water and let them sit there for a while and drink it, and this is very uplifting for me. A lot of people would have to take maybe this much to, and put it in their glass of water and let it sit for a couple of hours before they'll feel an effect. But I am very sensitive to nervings, so, and this is a nerving. So this is the, the tree that's right out there, right straight outside the window, if you see it, across the way there. And it's a very uplifting plant. This is what I use in my grief formulas. And if you just are having a day that's just bogging you down and you just want to be able to go, okay, I can breathe, keep on going. That's the plant that I would use. And it's the leaf, the flower, the bark is even more potent, but why bother? Because the leaf and the flower work really well. What's it called? Mimosa. I'm sorry, what? That's the cool water one. Yeah, I do a tincture with this as well that works just fine. But if you're going to make it as a tea, um, I just put a few leaves in water. And you can dry those leaves uh, and then put it, you know, just take them out in the wintertime, you know, on a really sad day. Sad is a, is a real thing, you know, with the weather related, you know, no sun. Sun attention. What does sad mean? Sun something deficit. Seasonal, seasonal affective disorder. Yes, not sun. Uh, it's really good for seasonal affective disorder. So, so the honeysuckle, did you say that was good for the immune system? Very, it's, a, it's an antiviral. It's an antiviral. Yep. All right, so anybody know what this leaf is? Sweet gum. S-C-H-W-E-E-T. -E -E um, what do we say about sweet gum? Hmm? COVID, that, that, sweet, that sweet gum ball looks like a COVID molecule. Hmm? Antibiotic. It's antibiotic. It's got chemic acid in it. No, I was teasing. That was just teasing. Sweet gum. It's sweet. Sorry. It's sweet. Sorry, that was just a little joke. Yeah, that looks like a maple leaf because it's pointed. Is that a maple leaf? That one looks a little weird to me. What is that? Does anybody know? It's maple. There's about 60 maples too. So uh, there'll be, and there's also a box elder that's called a maple. So. Uh, Sweet gum has five, one, two, three, four, five, and a maple will have three, oh. three lobes. Okay. All right, everybody knows what this is, right? You know what that is? You know what that is? Is that the plantain? That's the plantain. That's the plantain. So sweet gum, can you, it's just the balls that you're using that I had described before, but how about the leaves? Not the leaves. Not you won't use the leaves. You can use the balls uh, when they're green, or if you get them after that and it's still early, you can get the seed itself. But I prefer, I prefer a whole plant, so I will use the ball as much as possible and just chop it up with, because they're really hard. Just chop them up with uh, garden shears, fill a jar. You, this one is so potent, you don't have to do a ratio. You're gonna have a potent uh, remedy. Fill your jar two-thirds of the way full, and then fill it all the way up with PGA. It does require PGA, pure grain alcohol, at least 150 proof. PGA is technically 190 proof, but you can't get 190 in North Carolina. So you're saying, what do you mean fill it up two-thirds? Fill it up two-thirds with the, with the sweet gum pieces. Yeah, with the pieces that you've chopped it. Yes. No. Yes, you want to, You don't want to do vodka with this one. Mm -hmm. Those are plantain root. There's actually 20, 30 or more types of plantain. Nothing. Nothing. You would, you would do nothing with it. Yeah, it's just not going to extract. 
All right, does anybody know what this one is? How about if I put this with it? Dogwood. What's dogwood good for? You don't want to eat it. But dogwood, especially the fruit, when the fruit is created, or the bark, but you want to let the bark dry for a year. Very important. You want to let the bark dry for a year. But if you use the red berries, the fruit, you can use it as an antiviral, but it's better as a medicinal pain reliever. Again, for inflammation. Make sense? As a tincture. So, so as a tincture. You the red berries and save for a year? No, you can use the red berries, but if you're going to use the bark, which is more potent, you have to let it sit for a year. You have to dry it. You have to beat the squirrels and the birds from the, to the berries. I have, a, I have three or four in my backyard that are loaded. And maybe I don't have any squirrels. Maybe the... To get them? <laughs> really? One of them must have arthritis really bad. It'll just make you sick. You really need to let it sit for a year. It'll just make you sick, really sick. The berries come on after for the sap will mm -hmm. drop. Yeah. Do what? Do for the sap to yes. Dry. Yes. The sap will make you really sick. It's the tox the toxicity of it while it's fresh will make you sick. The same will happen if you wilt cherry bark. Or cherry leaves. Cherry is actually edible, not edible, excuse me. You can make a tea from it, wild cherry, black cherry. But if you get it while it's wilted, it can be toxic. Not toxic that it'll kill you, but it'll kill livestock. It'll kill a cow. Kill a cow. You want it either fresh or dried. And I mean by wilted, that's a couple of days. Like if you'd pull it and get home with it and it's not quite as fresh as it was, that's okay. But if, you, if it's gone for a couple of days without processing it, it has a toxicity. Because when that, when that toxin gets to a certain point of, of being dry, it's concentrated just enough. But when it gets completely dry, it's gone. So once it's concentrated, that's why it's, that's why it's, um, neighbor, yes. He, he's got several cows, and if he goes out after a storm or something, he looks, if there's any cherry trees across. You gotta get your cherry you trees off your fence. Yep, yep, that's true. So you said the bark either dried or fresh? Mm -hmm. so the fresh on the cherry. On the cherry, but on the, on the, um, the dogwood, it has to be dried. Has to be dried, okay. yep. All right. Here's a, a culprit that a lot of people blame for allergies. No. Golden rod. Golden rod. When it's actually the ragweed that's causing the problem. This gets so much blame. But you could take, you could eat this and it's not going to, you can eat ragweed. You know, you can eat ragweed before it makes a pollen. Before it blooms. You can eat the leaves of ragweed, it's very edible, it's in the Asteraceae family, just like a daisy, just like goldenrod. Um, Does it help with the allergies? Not, are you talking about ragweed? Yeah. Ragweed will actually take care of certain allergies. This is my number one go-to for allergies. Now you could make a tea out of these leaves, it's better if you get the unopened buds, you're going to get more potent tea and I make a tea just fine for allergies. Sinuses are, are cavities for a reason. Cavity means it's hollow. So if you're uh, if you have stuffed up nasal allergies, um, <coughs> you can take the the you did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to trying to prove a point there. Um, you can uh, you can use the leaves but the unopened buds are better. Now if you're gonna dry your your golden rod, you want to get unopened buds because if you get the buds that are already <laughs> open, you're just going to have fluff. So this is, and there are 600 varieties of golden rod. So can you, eat the in a salad? you can. I would get see the difference. You'll never look at plants for color the same way. You see how bright green these tips are. 
those would be the ones I, I would eat. See how, see how much brighter they are? Those are more meristematic. That's your word to look up. Meristematic means tasty bits. M-E-R-I-S-T-O-M-A-T-I-C, I think. Mary, M-E-R-I, stomatic. Stomach, Mary stomach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when that's real small, it's still going to look just the same when it's six inches tall, and there'll be more brighter green leaves at that point. You can eat kudzu, and what I would do is get the bright green leaves. Kudzu is 28% protein. You get, and I make a ravioli with kudzu. Oh, yeah. Get the bright green leaves. They'll be about this size, you know. So, oh, well. Not the brightest green, those are the freshest. So the young leaves. Young leaves, get the fresh leaves. I'll take my, my, I'll steam them just a minute, just barely steam them. And take my filling, just a little dab of filling and put on there. Wrap it up to make the little package. Put those upside down in a casserole dish and then I'll make that lemon piccata, lemon butter. If you don't eat butter, you can use another oil. Uh, lemon butter and, um, lemon butter and white wine of any type variety, especially if I make a goldenrod wine, I love goldenrod wine to cook with. Uh, but I'll just make that lemon piccata and I'll use my daisy bud capers, <clears throat> have, a, have a wild meal. Mm -hmm. So you just lay those in your casserole dish. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And a starch. You can use it as a starch to thicken food as well. Uh, but yeah, the, um, the root is good for alcohol, uh, alcoholism, people that's trying to come off Which of that. Are you talking about now? It's called kudzu. I don't have oh, it here. Have yeah, I don't have it here. All right, that is a what? We've already talked about it. Sweet gum. Uh, there's another plantain. It's one of my favorite plants, my top five. It's outside to the left. Poke. Poke. Oh. It's a poke leaf. You notice it didn't reach out and grab you there. I mean, the, the, uh, the wives' tails on poke salad has just come down terribly bad. And it is one of the best plants around. So, all right. That's you our little... Tea with this one? Yes. Y'all would do a cold tea with that. Oh, we talked about a, a lot of stuff that poke is good for. Um, it's a plant to be respected if you're going to eat those leaves, but I picked that leaf for a particular reason. Remember what I said about what, would, what you would eat? There were some larger leaves about like that. Yes, yeah, some very large plants, but if you're going to eat it, you want to get smaller leaves, less than this, and has to boil one time before you, pr you prepare it. And I'm interested in this one. You said, um, when you say cold, you just put it cold, in water. Cold water. That's yeah. all? Mm -hmm. And let it sit for about 30 minutes, an hour, even overnight. Mm -hmm. for it's, yeah, it's for an uplift. Yeah. I need some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Poison oak or poison ivy. Also, what's something else that's, that's sumac. sumac? Do you know how to recognize sumac out of the 200 varieties? Poison sumac is white berries, and your non-poisonous have red berries. And your poison sumac, is, they're all compound leaves, but the poison sumac has like uh, seven to 11 leaflets, where uh, non-poisonous has much more leaflets. And it's important too is in a poison sumac, in between the, the leaflets, the wing wages, doesn't exist. It's only in the uh, non poisonous in the wing wages. You don't know, you know, you know mean by the wing, wing wages. That little flat, that little flat. On the, on the stem, that's only on wing sumac. It's, it's, it's not on every. It doesn't exist on a poison It doesn't exist on staghorn sumac either. Pardon? It doesn't exist on staghorn sumac either. The winged, yeah, the winged sumac, what he's talking about 
is on, has everybody seen sumac on the side of the road? Those pretty red stags like this in late summer, it just sends up a shoot and you're thinking, oh, that would look pretty on a Christmas tree. It's so deep red. Once, you, once I've told you this, uh, this description, you're going to see it. And there's sumac out here too. Uh, but it's a, it's a stag. A stag is like a, what's another thing that's a stag? What else is a stag? I'm trying to think. Ant, well, um, I'm trying to think of something that would be, hmm? it's a cluster of red berries. And those red berries are very citrusy flavored. So if you got your phone with you, look up staghorn sumac. Well, winged sumac like he's saying, you've got your, your tall stalk here on the plant. If you look at the plant on the stalk and on the, um, on the branches, it looks like a little wing between each leaf. And that's a winged sumac. Out of the 200 varieties, there's quite a few that are winged, but staghorn sumac just makes that, and the winged sumac, will, the, the berries will kind of be a, a scattered cluster like this, but the winged or the staghorn sumac makes a stag. It kind of looks like a torch. Mm -hmm. You know, the end of a torch, how it's got a wide, you know, a big bulb, was well, kind of the same. But, but the it's, poison does not have the leaf. Right, it, uh, it's, it's bright red, um, grows on the side, grows more on like the edges of forests and things like that. How many times have you seen poison sumac? I have never seen it. I've only seen it once. It doesn't really grow in the it's southeast. Very rare. Very rare. It grows, it's, well, it's actually prolific in places like Washington uh, State, uh, out west. They have a lot more poison sumac. And in Florida, they have poison sumac with the white berries. But it's hard to find here. We even have fragrant sumac that just makes a flower and doesn't make the little red berry. Uh, but yeah, it's much more rare in this pl in this area. Has a high vitamin C. By high vitamin C, it's antioxidant. Uh, it's um, astringent. It'll tighten tissues. Really good for gums. Really good for cold sores. Um, lots of different things. Usually, especially in a gut issue. Did you? What was treatment? Yes, I'm sorry. I got off on sumac and, and forgot your question. I told you I'd go off on a tangent. Certain, because it's in the Roos family, R-H-U-S, Roos toxica, Roos whatever um, sumac is, I can't remember. But that Roos, R-H-U-S family is usually a toxic plant. That will be poison ivy, poison oak, sumac. There are a couple of other things in the Roos family that will give you toxic issues too. But if you're gonna, to, one way to treat poison ivy, poison oak, the first thing I would tell you to do is wash in vinegar. Um, <clears throat> if you're gonna wash in just soap, you really wanna scrub because I saw this video where uh, the guy, he compares the oil to brake fluid and if you just just scrub it like this you're not going to get the brake fluid off but if you scrub it you're going to get that oil off so you want to first thing get it off of your skin you want to take your clothes wash them in vinegar rinse them in vinegar and I'm talking about a cup or two in your wash spray make make a vinegar spray spray your boots spray your tools that you're using spray even on your if you get into it with your lawnmower you want to spray your lawnmower because you spray your doorknob handle because second contact is where you'll get it and it keeps coming back uh, a pharmacist told me one time to use dial soap doesn't matter what kind of soap he said dial soap pulls the oil out better mm -mm. Not necessarily, not necessarily. I've been told to use Dawn, I've been told to use Dial, I've been told to use Irish Spring, I've been told, and trust me, the scrubbing, if you will scrub it, and I'm not talking take the skin off, but you need to put some pressure on it and get it off. Just like, and if you want to test that theory, find something that's greasy, like old grease, and just put it on you and see how many times you can make a pat. You'll get it all over. Just that one contact like this won't get it off your fingers. You can come back and do it. So if you have it on your hand and you touch your doorknob, guess what's going to happen the next time you touch that doorknob? Well, 
or somebody else touches that doorknob mm -hmm. or, your sh or you lay down in on your sheets. So when you have that issue there and you have that toxicity, you want to get it off your skin, wash everything that you come in contact with. Now, if you still get a rash, what do you want to do? If you want to, if you can, you can use plantain. I use a vinegar plantain because I can't use just the, the plant itself. I'm allergic. I'm the only person I know that's allergic to, to plantain. I can't, if I, I will look like I have, somebody just threw acid on my rash if I put plantain on it. So it's just really, it's allergic, I'm allergic to it. But you can use calendula to ease that. And I add marshmallow, marshmallow root, or hibiscus, or okra water. All of those are in the hibiscus family, and they're very mucilagous, very emollient for your skin. Because when you use those really strong, harsh things on your skin, it's going to dry that rash out and cause the itching that's just going to keep on. You know how it gets cracked and dry? Uh, you can put the mucilage on there or aloe. I don't like aloe as much as I like other plants, like a mucilage, uh, and it will, it will help soothe that skin and get rid of it. But you want to pull that oil out. Bentonite clay is another one. If you take bentonite clay with a dehydrated powdered plantain and make a poultice with a little bit of water, it's going to help pull that out as well. Did you have a question? I was going to mention that usually when you have a poisonous plant, there's sometimes an endo plant that's next to it. Such as your poison ivy, you could have like a, a witch hazel. You, witch hazel will help. A lot of people think jewelweed is a remedy. Jewelweed is actually a, a to not toxic, but caustic. It's harsh for a lot of people. It will actually cause a rash. And it doesn't uh, stop the oil of poison ivy, it will, however, protect your skin. So you will need to, to get that on immediately. The jewelweed doesn't help after you get the rash. So if you think you've been exposed to uh, poison ivy and you see jewelweed, you can put the jewelweed on it. I'm allergic to it. I know a lot of people who are allergic to jewelweed and they don't realize that their rash is worse because they've used the jewelweed. So, uh, but yes, witch hazel is very good. You can make a tea, a cool tea with the, the witch hazel leaf, and that will help. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to tell us how to make a tincture from cold coconut? No. Are you going to give us a toothpaste powder recipe? <laughs> oh, yes. Let me give you, I'm, I'm going to have to go very quickly. So I'm going to give you the toothpaste powder. We didn't get, uh, we didn't actually get to talk. I've actually given y'all about six lessons today. <laughs> so you've had a lot of information, but I'm gonna give you my tooth powder um, that I use. And the reason for this is because you can actually heal a, a tooth before it gets to a point. If you've got just a very small, and that's a whole lesson in itself, so I'm kind of cheating you here. Um, you wanna take horsetail powder, and that's Equisetum hymali, not Equisetum arvense. There's two different kinds. So you want the horsetail, that's Equisetum High, H-Y-M-A-L-E. Not. Not Arvents, A-R-V-E-N-S-E. High Mally, Equisetum High Mally. So about a tablespoon of Equisetum High Mally. You can get horsetail in the, in the health food store in a capsule. So just break open a few of those and that's really good for uh, varicose veins silica is the building block uh, in your is one of the building blocks in your bones so horsetail is very good for your bones you can take those horsetail capsules about 10 days a month without causing an issue to your kidneys so you want to if you've um, you got your tablespoon of horsetail uh, a tablespoon of, or about two tablespoons, excuse me, of bentonite clay. And then you can use white oak bark. You can get white oak bark in the capsule in the, in the health food store. And a lot of people will use white oak bark for varicose veins because it does help with vein strength. But I'll use that to tighten tissues in my, in my mouth. About a tablespoon. It's equal, equal parts. And then you can mix that. If you want it as a powder, you can mix it with baking soda or a mineral salt. Table salt won't do. And never use salt, table salt with iodine in it, ever. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard... 
with never use table salt with iodine. So like Celtic sea salt? Celtic sea salt, uh, Himalayan salt, as long as you know where it comes from. If it comes from Pakistan, it probably has lead and other toxins in it. If it comes from India, it's not blown up with explosives to, to get it. They mine, they actually mine. How much salt do you use all of this? About three tablespoons of salt. If you're gonna use this as a powder, if you're not gonna use it as a powder, you don't put the salt in it. Oh, you know, so how, what's another way to use it? I'm about to tell you. Oh. Yeah. If you're gonna use it as a powder, mix it with baking soda or salt. Okay. If you're gonna use it as a paste, Mix it with mix that amount with about a half a cup of coconut oil, <clears throat> and you'll want to mix it up really well. You don't want to liquefy your coconut oil. You just want to leave it at a room temperature and just mix it up really well. Okay, and then it'll you'll just take your pea size amount and put on your toothbrush. And if you don't want to, you know, I just put it in a nice little jelly jar and use it. And this one lady said, well, there's seven people in our house. That's kind of nasty. Everybody putting their toothbrush down into the same paste. I said, well, put a little bit in different jelly jars for everybody, you know, the little four ounce, and then you can flavor it as you want to. You can flavor that mixture. That mixture is very healing for your mouth. You can put that mixture and put some xylitol, and the amount is to taste. It can be a half a teaspoon to a tablespoon. Xylitol is non-cavity forming. It's actually helpful to your teeth. Not that sugar is helpful, but it's going to not promote tooth decay. <clears throat> and that's xylitol, anywhere from half teaspoon to a tablespoon, whatever you want. Then you can put powdered mint, like if you're drying your peppermint from your garden, <clears throat> dry that and powder it very fine and put that in there. Or you can take a, 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 an orange and uh, zest it, dry that, powder it very fine and have orange flavored. Put clove powder in there with the orange. It's really good. Or you can put orange clove chocolate. Chocolate's actually antiseptic. So if you have chocolate toothpaste, man, that is so good. It's like, it's like a little after dinner mint, chocolate mint. So all of those, but that's your basic recipe. Um, How and long it, is that, like, <clears throat> I mean, that um, paste? As long as the coconut oil would be good. So what, a couple years, something like that. A year, a couple years. I've never had it go bad. I use it faster than that. So yeah. I'm sorry, say again? How do you use the powder? Um, just like you would baking soda. Just on your toothbrush. Yeah, just on your toothbrush. So it's one tablespoon of, of each. Kale yeah. mm -hmm. with one half tablespoon half of all the rest of them, too. And a half so cup of coconut oil with that? And a half a cup of coconut oil, yeah. I'll just say, I have something similar that I make just in my store. I have, um, they have butternut clay, colloidal silver, um, Celtic salt. Um, yeah, Patty's got one too that if you are interested in. Do you have Any, a I do. It's Simple Homestead Living. And then you sell your mm -hmm. I have about 150 products. I'll take about 120 with me to shows. We just got through with eight shows in six states. We're a little tired. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I don't take about 30 to 50 remedies with me because I want to monitor very closely. These would be more considered over the counter what I take. You know, be pain, headache, you know, things like that. So, it has a caustic chemical in it so that can cause irritation. If you use it and you're not having any trouble with it, then continue using it. So, and I'm not here to change anybody's mind about anything like that. So, yeah. If you have somebody that came back and said it didn't work and their rash got worse, that's probably why. And that may only be a very small amount of people. I know I'm one and I can't use jewel weed and I know other people that can't either that really have a problem and their rash actually gets worse than before it gets better. So, yeah. All right, any other questions or comments? That Thank you.